Chapter thirty seven of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty seven Diplomacy. Mrs. May crossed rapidly and noiselessly to the door and closed it. Not that there was any need for caution, seeing that the primitive household had been abed long ago but precaution is never wasted. There was coffee in the grate kept hot by means of a spirit lamp. Mrs. May poured out a cup and handed it to her guest. She lay back in her chair, watching him, with a keen glance and the easy, natural insolence, the cruel cutting superiority of the great over the small. The man stood, his hands thrust into the folds of his loose sleeves, a picture of patient resignation. "'How did you get here?' the princess asked. "'At the great house in London I asked, O oh mistress,' Ben here replied. "'I came over, as thou knowest, to do certain work. There was yet another one with me, and when my work was done, I came on to tell what thy slave had accomplished. "'You have proofs of what you say?' "'Else I had not been here. For two years we have followed up the track of the victim. It was as if we had searched for one single perch in the hole of a great lake of water. But we never tired and never slept both at the same time. Then at last we got near and it came to the knowledge of the prey that we were upon him. That was long before the last cold weather that nearly starved us. The man paused and shivered. The princess nodded with careless sympathy. She had never tried a winter in England, but she could imagine what it was. "'He knew us at last,' Ben here resumed. "'He met us face to face in the public street.' and he knew that his hour had come. A night later he was in Paris. At the same time we were in Paris also. He tried Rome, Vienna, Berlin. So did we. Then he came back to London again. When he did so, we knew that he had bowed his face before the all-seeing and prayed that the end might come speedily. The princess followed all this with impatience, but the man was speaking after the manner of his kind and could not be hurried. He would go to the end without omitting a single detail, and the princess was forced to listen. Despite the western garb and the evidences of western life and custom about her, she was no longer Mrs. May, but Princess Zara. She had only to close her eyes, and the droning intonation and passionless voice of the speaker took her back to Lhasa again. And the day was near, ah, the day was near, when the goal would be reached. "'Once we had him, and once he escaped,' Ben here went on. "'He was a brave man, was Vosky, and nothing could break down those nerves of iron.' He knew that the end was near. It was in a big house, a house near to London, that we found him. There were servants, and they were glad to have their fortunes told. It was their evening meal on the table when we got there, and the man, Vosky Sahib, was out. Then, behold, after that evening meal the servants slept till the dawn, and at midnight the master returned. He came into his study, and the bright flash of the lightning came at the touch of his fingers. "'Electric light,' the princess said impatiently. "'Go on.' Then he saw us. We knew that he had no weapon. The door we barred. Then Vosky, he sit down and light a cigar, smiling, smiling all the time. When we look at him, we see that he moves not so much as a little finger. There was no sign of fear, except that he looked at a little box on the table now and then. 
Ah, the princess cried, you got it, eh? Ben here made no direct reply. He was not to be hurried. He meant to describe a sordid murder in his own cold-blooded way. Probably he did not regard the thing as a crime at all. He had been acting under the blessing of the priests. "'You have come for it?' he asked. We bowed low with respect, saying that we had come for it. He lay back in his chair, making a sign for me to approach. Previously we had told him that it was useless for him to call out to the servants. "'You did not tell those servants their fortunes in your present garb?' "'No, no, my mistress. We know such pigs as that. Sahib Vosky bid me approach. My friend had the pie ready on the cloth. It was held to the head of the other, and so he died peacefully in his chair.' ah so you say where are your proofs ben heer slowly withdrew a white packet from the folds of his dress what better proof could the slave of my illustrious mistress have he asked it is here the precious stone with the secrets of the gods written on it behold with a slightly dramatic gesture a glittering fragment of something that looked like green jade was held on high. The princess grasped it eagerly and devoured it with her eyes. Words were pouring in a liquid stream from her lips. She was transformed almost beyond recognition. "'At last,' she murmured, "'at last! But the other one, your companion, how did he die?' You say he is dead. How? Ben here shook his head sadly. I cannot say, he replied. It might have been some scheme of the part of Sahib Vosky. When we got back to our room in London, we were both dreadfully ill. For days I lie, and when I get better, they tell me my poor friend is dead and buried. Then I understood why Vosky Sahib smile and smile in that strange way. It was witchcraft, perhaps, or some devil we do not know in the East. But there is the stone. The princess was regarding the shining stone with a besotted enthusiasm that seemed grotesquely out of place with her dress and surroundings. Perhaps this suddenly flashed upon her for she carefully locked up the stone. "'You have done well, Ben here, she said, "'and shall not go unrewarded. "'The worst part of our task is over. "'The rest is easy.' "'Then the princess goes not back to Lhasa?' Ben here asked. "'Oh, not yet, not yet, "'not till they are destroyed, root and branch, "'to the smallest twig in the tree.' I have not spared myself, and I am not going to spare others. Yet there remain those of the accursed race yonder, the Ravenspurs. They know too much. They have that which I require. I will kill them off. They shall die. Has my mistress slew her husband when his life was of no more value to her? Ah, so you know that. You would not reproach me, Ben here? Does the slave reproach the master who keeps his carcass from the kennel? Ben here asked as he bowed low. My mistress was right. Her hands were washed whiter than the snow in the blood of the Christian. It was well. It was just. Then you shall help me, for there is much to be done. Take this ring. Place it on your finger and go to the others. They are outside waiting. Give them the call thus. The princess made a faint noise like the dowsy call of a bird, and Ben here caught it up at once. He had heard it many times before. Then he slipped out like a cat in the darkness, 
and presently the call came from the gloom. A moment later it was answered, and then all was still again. Mrs. May, who had discarded the princess for a moment, closed her window, drew the blinds, and lighted a cigarette. It was a glad night for her. "'So those two are out of the way,' she murmured. "'The road is clear at last, clear to the vengeance that must be mine. And with the vengeance comes the wealth that should make me a feared and dreaded power in the East. Give me but the wealth, and Lassa shall be my footstool.'" End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty eight. Geoffrey gets a shock. Ralph Ravenspur had wandered along the cliffs, and Geoffrey had followed him. The latter came up to the blind man at the loneliest part of the rugged granite, and there for a time they sat. Ralph was graver and more taciturn than usual, till presently his head was raised, and he seemed to be listening to something intently. "'What is the matter?' Geoffrey asked. "'Somebody is close to us,' Ralph explained. "'Somebody is creeping up to us in the gorse. Nay, you need not move. We are safe here on this bare ledge.' There is one thing there is no cause to fear in dealing with these miscreants, and that is firearms. Weapons of that description make a noise, and your Oriental hates noise when he is out on the kill. Ah, what did I tell you? Somebody is close by. A figure rose out of the gorse, a slender figure with a ragged beard and brown face. The stranger crept along and dropped by Geoffrey's side. "'Don't be alarmed,' he said. "'It is only I, Tchigorsky.' Geoffrey was astonished, though he had no occasion to be. Ralph took the matter coolly. "'I expected something like this,' he said. "'I knew you would desire to see me, and that is why we came along the rocks.' Chigorsky lay on his back, puffing at a cigarette. "'Keep your eyes open,' he said to Geoffrey. "'One can't be too particular. Not that there is any danger, for I've sent those two wretches off on a wild goose chase for an hour or two, and the she-devil is down with one of her blinding headaches. You wouldn't think she was a woman whose heart is in a weak state, eh?' "'I shouldn't have supposed she had one,' said Geoffrey. "'Have you seen her?' "'I was in her company for a long time last night,' Tchigorsky explained. "'I posed as one of the murderers of Vosky. "'I gave her proofs of my success.' "'The forged Garuda stone,' Ralph chuckled. "'The same,' Tchigorsky said gravely. It was a magnificent forgery, and calculated to deceive these pious, murderous old rascals at Lhasa. At any rate, I am now deep in the confidence of the princess, and attached to her subordinates, who are pledged to assist in wiping out the Ravenspur family. Geoffrey sighed involuntarily. He would have liked to know why this vendetta aimed at his family but he knew that the question would be useless. Still, he felt that a great deal had been gained during the last few hours. "'Have you learned what the latest villainy is?' Ralph asked. "'Not yet. There is much uneasiness and alarm felt over the recent failures, and my dusky allies are getting a little frightened. For the next day or two I expect we shall lie low and plan some big coup. What I want to secure now are the princess's private papers. I know she has them and is in regular communication with the priests at Lhasa. Give me these and I can expose the whole plot. 
let me wipe these three people out, and then Lassa shall get a hint that will save further trouble from that quarter. A hint from the India office that any more rascality will mean an expedition to Lassa, and the destruction of their temples will suffice. But first I must have my proofs. Without proofs I am helpless. Find them, Ralph croaked. Find them. Never mind the scandal. Never heed what people may say. Bring the matter home. Hang those wretches, and we shall never more be troubled by this plague from the east. If I had my way, I would shoot the whole lot. And be hanged for your pains, Tchigorsky replied. Ah, my friend, there are serious flaws in the criminal laws of this fine country of yours. Patience, patience. I shall find out everything in time. There is one thing I am curious to know, said Geoffrey. I want to know who was the girl on the cliff with Mrs. May that afternoon, the girl who has such an amazing likeness to Marion. Have you discovered that, Tchigorsky? That is what I am trying to get at myself, Tchigorsky replied with great gravity. It is one of the mysteries of the campaign. Geoffrey said no more on the point, chiefly because he had no more to say. Yet it was haunting him now, as it had done for some time past. It filled his mind as he made his way down the cliffs after luncheon, and then, to his surprise, as he gained the sands, he saw a figure rise from the rocks and flit along the beach until it flashed round a distant point. It was the girl who bore that surprising resemblance to Marion. She was dressed, as before, in a blue skirt and red tam o shanter With a sudden impulse Geoffrey followed. His feet flew over the heavy sands, making no noise. As he turned the rocky point he saw no signs of the girl, but there on the beach, with her sketch-book on her knee, was Marion herself, so deeply interested in manipulating her watercolors that she did not see Geoffrey till he hailed her. "'Did you see her?' Geoffrey gasped. Marion smiled at his excited face. "'See whom?' she asked. "'Oh, yes, some girl did pass me but I was so busily engaged that I did not look up. How do you think my sketch is progressing? I have been at it all the morning. Vera made me a small bet that I should not finish it today, so I am going to win my bet or perish in the attempt. Geoffrey was hardly listening. He recollected that there had been some little chaff at luncheon over some sketch, but he had paid little heed to the subject. "'It was the same girl,' he said. "'The girl so like you. Oh, Marion, how unfortunate you did not look up!' "'It was indeed,' Marion replied. She appeared to be deeply interested. "'I would have given anything to see her. But it is not too late. Put my materials in your boat, Jeff.' and I will follow up the cliffs. I can't be very much use, I'm afraid, but at any rate I may solve this much of the mystery." Geoffrey returned to his boat. It seemed very strange to him that Marion should not have seen the girl, and also that on each occasion these two should have been so close together without meeting. Geoffrey pushed his boat out, got his sails up, and then stood out for the bay. It was very quiet, and no other boats were to be seen. One or two of the upper windows of the castle were visible from there, but no other signs of habitation. The breeze freshened as Geoffrey reached the open sea. Some distance from him a pile of wreckage covered with a mass of seaweed floated on the water. "'I'll anchor here and get my lines out,' said Geoffrey. He luffed, and as he did so, a puff of wind filled the sail. 
the mast gave an ominous crack and the whole thing snapped and went by the board geoffrey stared with widely open eyes the wind was as nothing barely enough to belly the sail then he looked down and saw that the mast had been almost sawn away somebody had cut it nearly through so that the first puff would suffice geoffrey felt vaguely alarmed and uneasy he was a good four miles from shore and was an indifferent swimmer the sea was too dangerous and rough for bathing there might be further treachery he sat down and pulled hard at the oars with the idea of returning to the beach again as he bent his back to the work he toppled over the seat with two short stumps in his hands the oars too had been sawed through and geoffrey was helpless four miles from land in an open boat with no means of progress and nobody in sight the position was alarming there would be nothing for it but to wait until some passing craft came along and picked him up but the time went by without any sign of a boat and starvation might be the result nor was the position improved when it began to dawn upon geoffrey that the boat was filling fast he saw that a large hole had been bored in the bottom and filled with some kind of substance that slowly dissolved in the water with a tin dipper geoffrey worked away with all his might but he could only keep the water from rising higher and knew that the exertion would soon tell upon him help he cried help 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 he ceased to call as suddenly as he had begun what was the use of calling so long as nobody could hear him and why waste the breath that would be so precious to him later he could not see that the mass of wreckage and seaweed had drifted close to the boat he saw nothing till a line thrown into the boat struck him smartly on the face he looked up can you manage to keep her afloat a hoarse voice came from the wreckage for an hour perhaps geoffrey replied why that will do said the other i've got a paddle here hitch the rope onto the nose of the boat and bail out for all you are worth this is another of the princess's little tricks i expected it only it hasn't turned out quite the way that i anticipated now bail away chigorsky geoffrey gasped chigorsky very much at your service i rigged up this contrivance this morning and pushed off with it not long before you came down but never mind me stick to your dipper and i'll tell you all about it when we are ashore it was hard and weary work for both of them but it was accomplished at last geoffrey was utterly exhausted when the boat was safely beached and tchigorsky too felt the effect of his exertions he lifted himself cautiously off his raft and made a dart for one of the caves inside he had dry clothing long flowing robes wig and hair for his face pigments that changed the hue of one hemisphere to that of another geoffrey limp and exhausted watched the artistic transformation with admiration it's wonderful he said but then you are a wonderful man tchigorsky how did it all happen who did it tchigorsky smiled as he touched up his face it was inspired by a woman and carried out by a woman he said i dared not warn you before you started and indeed i expected further developments but a woman doctored your boat for you geoffrey started as an idea came to him was she young and good-looking he asked dressed in dressed tchigorsky smiled in a blue serge dress and a red tam-o-shanter 
I need not ask if you have met the lady before. End of chapter 38「Thirty Nine of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Nine Princess Zara's Terms. Geoffrey had no reason to fear anything from his adventure in the way of catching cold, seeing that beyond his feet he was not in the least wet but the exertion had brought the great beads to his forehead, and he lay at the entrance of the cave exhausted. Meanwhile Tchigorsky had appeared again clad in the long oriental robes that suited him so well. Even in the strong light that filtered through a crack on to his face, Geoffrey found it impossible to recognize him. "'Are you feeling better?' he asked. "'All right.' Geoffrey gasped. "'I'm a little bit pumped, of course.' Tchigorsky pointed to the boat pulled over the ledge of rock. "'Then oblige me by shoving her off and letting her sink in shallow water,' he said. "'It is not pleasant and may cause your friends a great deal of anxiety, but for a little while it will be necessary for the world to regard you as one who has met with a watery grave.' "'But surely this does not apply to my family?' Geoffrey asked anxiously. "'To your family most of all,' said Tchigorsky coolly. "'It is all part of the scheme. "'My dear boy, I am the last man in the world to cause unnecessary suffering. "'Goodness knows I have had enough of my own. "'But one must be cruel to be kind sometimes. "'I have worked out the scheme.' I have seen the enemy's cards, and I am playing mine accordingly. I tell you, the step is imperative. But Vera, Geoffrey groaned, it will kill Vera. In normal circumstances the shock would be great. With a girl who has been so awfully tried, the news may mean loss of reason. I have thought of that, Tchigorsky said. At least your uncle Ralph and I have worked it out between us. Miss Vera is not to know anything of our scheme, but she is to know that you are safe and well. Come, I fancy you can trust Ralph Ravenspur. Geoffrey nodded. He felt easier in his mind. Not that he was satisfied, but it would be flying in the face of Providence to interfere with the delicate and deeply laid scheme of a man like Tchigorsky. "'All right,' he said. "'I'll do as you desire.' "'Then push the boat off without further delay. You will understand why I don't want to be seen in the matter. Go before anyone comes along.' Geoffrey went obediently. He had not much fear of anybody passing. Nevertheless, he did not neglect proper precautions. As he reached the cave again, he found Tchigorsky lying on a heap of dry seaweed, smoking a cigarette. "'I suppose I have to thank Mrs. May for this?' Geoffrey asked. "'For this and other things,' Tchigorsky nodded. "'I knew it was coming. In fact, very little can happen now that I am not in a position to discount. My ruse succeeded capitally. Behold in me, Ben here, one of the two miscreants who succeeded in destroying Vosky. My colleague perished in the attempt. The princess is convinced of that? Absolutely. She is certain that I, Sergius Tchigorsky, have gone over to the great majority. Besides, I have placed proof of my alleged crime in her hand. The Garuda stone, all the fuss was about. It is a clever imitation, but that is beside the question. So you have been taken into her confidence? Well, not exactly that, but every new scheme is relegated so far as details are concerned to some of us 
and therefore I am in a position to discount the future. In ordinary circumstances, I should simply have warned you against going fishing today, and thus checkmated the foe again, but that would have been inartistic. Besides, I wanted the princess to regard you as another victim, hence the whole of this rather cheap dramatic business. You will come to life again in a few hours, when we shall have to be guided by events. Who was it who tampered with the boat? You will learn in good time. Let us meanwhile assume that it was the work of one of my dusky companions. For the present you and I remain where we are, till dark probably, when it will be possible to smuggle you up to your uncle's room. I have not been regardless of your creature comforts. Here are cold meat and a bottle of champagne. We dine together. Geoffrey accepted his portion with resignation. And Tchigorsky was an entertaining companion. There was no dullness in his presence. Very well, Geoffrey said as he lighted a cigarette. We are safe here. Now's the time for a further recital of your thrilling adventures in Lhasa. Agreed, Tchigorsky cried. Where did I leave off? You had been gagged and bound at the instigation of the princess. True. It is also true that but for the intervention of the same princess, we should have been torn to pieces on the spot, and, incidentally, I may mention that that would have resulted in the absolute extinction of the House of Ravenspur. The men who a moment before had been grave, reserved priests were transformed instantly into raging fiends. Had they been possessed by devils, they could not have flamed out more suddenly. They were mad to know that the secrets of all ages had passed into the hands of Christian dogs, dogs who had defiled their altars. And yet much the same kind of barbarous fanaticism has been displayed in civilized dominions. They were not any worse than the bigots who burned your English martyrs. We should have been torn to pieces on the spot, as I told you, but for the authority of the princess. So commonplace a death did not suit her ideas of the eternal fitness of things. Many and many a time afterwards, when racked by agony, I deeply deplored that supposed act of clemency. It would have been a far more merciful death. Well, we were spared for the moment, and cast into a loathsome dungeon, where we were overrun with vermin, great rats which we had constantly to drive off, and spiders whose bite was very painful. How long we lay without food, I don't know. Anyway, it seemed days. Perhaps it was only so many hours. Try lying in the pitch dark, fighting with nameless unseen terrors, and see how many bitter years can be crammed into a minute. And yet we knew there was far worse to come. But for the fact that we were together and could cheer the black hours with the sound of each other's voices, we should have gone mad. One moment we were cast down in the depths of gloom. The next we prayed for death. Anon we laughed and sang sketches of gay songs. We were not insane, but were treading perilously near to the borderland. Then, after many years, or so it seemed to us, they fetched us again. We were not led into the banqueting hall, but to a long, low, vault-like place on the floor, of which were two shallow tanks or baths, covered over with a frame of iron, and from the frame of iron ran long sliding rods, for all the world like a bird's cage, only the sliding wires of the cage ran far into the room. Around these cages were glowing charcoal fires, the greater part of the sliding bars or wires growing red and crocus blue from the heat. 
What did it mean? I wondered. Ah, I was very soon to know. Tchigorsky drew a deep breath and a shudder passed over his powerful frame. The moisture on his forehead was not due to the heat alone. On a throne of stone the princess was seated. A few of the higher-grade priests were grouped around her. Evidently they had been discussing us and had made up their minds. We were not going to be tried, even. "'Stand there,' the princess commanded. "'Dogs, do you want to live?' Ralph Ravenspur said nothing. He was ever a man of few words. "'We have no desire to die,' I replied. "'Nothing that breathes ever has. "'Even if I were an old man with one foot in the grave, "'the desire for life would be as strong upon me as it is now.' "'The princess smiled. "'I will not try to describe that smile. "'If you had seen it, you would have given ten years of your life to forget it again.' "'It is in your hands to live,' the woman said. "'It is for you to say whether or not you return to your people. "'But you shall not carry our cherished secrets to the West. "'You shall live, you shall grow free, "'but you shall take no memory of the past with you.' "'I guessed at once what she meant. "'There were attendants upon the priests, "'poor fools who fetched and carried,' who would undertake errands one at a time, but who had no reasoning powers, no wits of their own. They were not born idiots, they had been made so. They are put under drugs, a portion of the scalp is removed, and then some small fragment of the brain is destroyed. We could have our liberty if we chose, but at what price? We could go free, but for the rest of our lives we should never know the blessed light of reason again. I tell you, it came to me like a cold shock and turned me faint and giddy. As I glanced at my companion, I saw that he was ghastly as myself. What use was life to us under such conditions? And the fiends were equal to the cruelty of getting us to consent to this operation and then detaining us afterwards. We should be a mockery among them and a warning to others. There was no reason to discuss this defined cruelty, this vile offer. We glanced at each other and shook our heads. Far better death than this. We knew how to die. We could have drawn our revolvers and shot each other, then and there. But we did not. While there was life, there was hope. End of chapter 39「Chapter 40 of the Mystery of the Raven Spurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40: The Iron Cage. Tchigorsky made a long pause before he resumed his story. His nerves appeared to require composing. It was impossible to shake off the horror of the past. At length he went on again. I saw the cruel light flame into the eyes of the princess. I saw that she was pleased and yet sorry to learn our decisions. She gave a sign and we were brought nearer to her. "'You understand what your refusal means?' she said. "'You have been here long enough to know how carefully our secrets are guarded and also how we punish those who try to read them. "'Where are those scripts?' "'We had no scripts, and I said so. "'As a matter of fact, such formula and papers as we had managed to become possessed of "'had been smuggled beyond Lassa to Ralph Ravenspur's servant, Elphick who had conveyed them to a place of safety. But my statement was without effect. "'Strip them,' she said, "'and put them in the baths.' 
We were going to learn, then, what those cages were for. "'There is no need to remove our clothing,' I cried. "'We will do it ourselves.' I was afraid our revolvers should be discovered, or the cartridges be rendered useless by immersion. Ralph seemed to understand, for, like myself, he quickly discarded his robes and slippers and professed himself to be ready. Then the grating was raised, and we were placed on our backs in a shallow bath formed in the shape of a coffin, and not more than ten inches deep. As first the baths were empty, but gradually they were filled with water until we had to raise our faces and press them against the bars to breathe. I thought that we were to be suffocated in this shallow water, a dreadful idea that filled me with stifling anxiety, but there was worse to come. Again Tchigorsky paused and wiped his brow. The suspense was torture. The terrible uncertainty of what was going to happen was agony. Imagine being drowned with the bare half-inch of water over your lips and nostrils. I turned my head a fraction of an inch on one side, and then I saw that the water could not rise quite high enough to drown me without overflowing the edge of the bath. Evidently this was but the first chapter in the book of lessons. We could breathe by placing our faces against the bar. What next? There was no occasion to ask the question. Though my heart was drumming like the wings of an imprisoned fly, and though there was the roar of a furnace in my ears, I could make out the crack and rattle of machinery, and the bars over the cage began to move. My face, to escape the water, was so closely pressed to the bars that the friction was painful. The bars slid along, and as they did so, I remembered the long projecting ends which were glowing yellow and blue in the braziers. My heart ceased drumming and then seemed to stand still for the moment. I had guessed the riddle. A second later, and the horizontal bars over my face were white-hot. Here was the situation, then. I had either to press my face against those cruel bars, or drown in a few inches of water. Could the mind of a man imagine a more diabolical torture? I cried aloud. I believe my friend did also, but I cannot say. My face flinched involuntarily from the scar of the blistering iron. I held my breath till the green and red stars danced before my eyes. Flesh and blood could stand it no longer, and I was literally bound to raise my head. Into the flesh, as you have seen for yourself, those hot barriers pressed, while I filled my lungs with a deep draught of delicious air but the agony was so great that I had to go down again. The water cooled the burns for the moment, but you can imagine how it intensified the agony afterwards. When I raised myself again the bars were cool, but only for an instant, for they came hot once more, this time in a horizontal direction. The same ghastly business was enacted, Again there was the sense of semi-suffocation, again the long draught of pure air and the pain from the bars. And then, while wondering, half delirious, how long it could last, something gave way and I fainted. That I deemed to be death, but it was nothing of the kind. When I came to, I was lying on the floor, writhing in agony from my wounds. Fortunately, I had not lost my sight, nor had Ralph at that time. He was to discover later that the injuries received were fatal to his eyes. He was lying by my side and groaning with pain, like myself. A more hideous and more repulsive sight than my companion's face I never wished to look upon. 
and doubtless he had the same thoughts of me. But I did not think of that at the moment. We were alone. I staggered to my feet and across to the door. It was fastened, of course. For a time we were too maddened by pain to take heed of anything, but gradually reason came back to us. My first idea was of revenge. Ralph had grasped for his robes, and his revolver was in his hand. "'Heaven help the first man who comes in!' he yelled. Like a drunken lunatic, I applauded the sentiment. For a minute we were both mad as the drugged Malay who runs amuck. Fortunately, nobody did come in for some time, and gradually wiser counsel prevailed. We slipped into our garments and hid our revolvers. Then from raging madmen we passed to tears. We were so spent and exhausted that we cried like little children. But men like ourselves are not easily daunted. The pain was still great, but this only stimulated our desire to live and gain the better of those who had so cruelly used us. Later a priest conducted us into another room, where the princess awaited us. She smiled as she looked at our faces. That smile was nearly the end of her. Many a time since have I regretted that I didn't finish her career then and there. Had she betrayed the least sign of fear, I should have done so. And by so doing, your people would have been saved many a bitter sorrow." "'At the expense of your life,' Geoffrey said. Chigorsky shrugged his shoulders. "'What matter?' he said. "'The few suffer for the many. Well, as I was saying,' the speaker paused suddenly as his eye caught something moving along the beach. It was the figure of a woman creeping along, as if in search of some missing object. She proceeded very slowly until she approached the spot where the boat lay filled and sunk, and then she paused abruptly. For a minute she stood fascinated by the sight, then she flung her hands high in the air, and a bitter wailing cry escaped her. If she had been a fisherman's wife, suddenly brought face to face with the dead body of her husband or lover, her wail of anguish had not been more poignant. "'Who can she be?' Geoffrey asked. Chigorsky said nothing. The woman stood with her hands raised. As she turned and ran toward the cliffs, moaning as she went, Geoffrey started. "'Marion!' he said. "'Marion!' He would have dashed forward, but Tchigorsky restrained him. "'That is not your Marion,' he said. "'Your Marion does not dress like that.' Geoffrey looked again. It was Marion, and yet not Marion. It was the girl in the blue serge dress and red tam-o'-shanter who resembled her so strikingly. What did this girl know about him? And why did she stand wailing over his boat? He felt he must solve this mystery. "'Sit down,' Chigorsky said slowly. "'Sit down.' "'But,' Geoffrey cried, "'I insist upon knowing—' "'And spoiling everything. "'Sit down, I say, or I shall have to detain you.' I don't fancy you would care to measure your strength with mine. Geoffrey dropped into his seat. Perhaps not, he said. I don't believe you want me to know who that girl is. I have heard worse guesses, Tchigorsky said dryly. End of chapter 40Chapter Forty One of the Mystery of the Raven Spurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty One Waiting. 
They were growing uneasy at the castle. There was a forced cheerfulness about the small party that testified to the nervous tension that held them. For some years now there had been a tacit understanding on the subject of punctuality. Such a thing was necessary when any moment might precipitate the next catastrophe. The mere fact of anybody being late for five minutes sufficed to put the rest in a fever. And Geoffrey had not come in to tea at all. The thing was almost in itself a tragedy. Geoffrey was always so considerate of others. Nothing in the world would have induced him to stay away without first saying he was going to do so, or sending a message, and tea had been a thing of the past for a good hour. What could have become of him? Nobody asked the question, but it was uppermost in the minds of all. Vera was chattering with feverish gaiety, but there was a blazing red spot on her ghastly white face, and her eyes were wild and restless. Marion had slipped away. The only one who betrayed no anxiety was Ralph. He sat sipping his chilled tea as if he had the world to himself and there was nobody else in it. Presently, with one excuse or another, all slipped away until Vera was alone with Ralph. He was so quiet that she had almost forgotten his presence. When she thought herself alone, she rose to her feet and paced the room rapidly. She pressed her hands to her throbbing temples. "'God, spare him,' she whispered. "'Spare him to me. Oh, it is wicked to feel like this, and so utterly selfish. But if Geoffrey dies, I have nothing to live for.' The tears rose to her eyes, tears of agony and reproach and self-pity. Ralph crossed the room silently. He was upon the girl ere she had heard the soft fall of his footsteps. He laid a hand on Vera's arm. "'Geoffrey is not going to die,' he said. Vera suppressed a scream. She might have cried out, but something in the expression of Ralph's face restrained her. "'Are you sure of that?' she asked. "'As sure as one can be certain of anything, child. We are alone?' "'There is nobody else here, uncle.' "'One cannot be too careful,' Ralph muttered. "'Then Geoffrey is safe.' "'Thank heaven. You have sent him somewhere, uncle?' "'No, I have not sent him anywhere. And you are not to ask any questions.' I have told you so much to spare you the agony and suspense that will overtake the others. I tell you because, had you not known, the mental strain might have broken you down," continued Ralph. Before long it will be proved almost beyond a demonstration that Geoffrey has become a victim to the family foe. There will be evidence to convince a jury, but all the time Geoffrey will be safe. Vera said nothing. She could only gasp. Ralph's hand lay on her shoulders with a grip that was not devoid of pain. "'You are not to show your feelings to anyone,' he croaked. "'You are not to betray your knowledge by a single sign. Ah, if I could tell you how much depends upon your courage, reticence, and your silence!' I think you can trust me, Uncle Ralph. I think I can, dear. I like the ring of your voice. You are to be quiet and subdued, as if you were unable to comprehend the full force of the disaster. Much, if not everything, depends upon the next few hours. Now go, please. Ralph slipped away into the grounds. A little later he was making his way along the cliffs toward the village. For a brief time Vera stood still. She was trying to realize what Ralph had said. "'What did it mean?' she asked herself again and again. 
but she could find no answer to the puzzle. Still, Geoffrey was safe. Whatever sensation the next few hours might produce, Geoffrey had come to no harm. It would be hard to see the others suffer, hard to witness their grief, and not lighten it by so much as a sign. But Ralph had been emphatic on this point. Had he not said that everything hinged upon her reticence and silence? Vera went slowly to her room, her feet making no sound on the thick pile carpet. A flood of light streamed through the stained glass windows into the corridor. In the big recess at the end, a white figure lay face downward on the cushions. Vera approached softly. She saw the shoulders rise and fall, as if the girl lying there were sobbing in bitter agony. It was Marion, Marion the ever cheerful. Surely her grief must be beyond the common. Marion, Vera whispered, dear Marion. She bent over the prostrate figure with heartfelt tenderness. Marion raised her face at length. It was wet with tears, and her eyes were swollen. At first she seemed not to recognize Vera. "'Go away,' she said hoarsely. "'Why do you intrude upon me like this? Am I never to have a minute to myself? Am I always to carry the family troubles on my shoulders?' She spoke fiercely, with a gleam in her eyes that Vera had never seen before. She drew back, frightened and alarmed. It seemed incredible that gentle Marion could repulse her like this. But she did not go. Marion was beside herself with grief. She did not know what she was saying. It was impossible to leave her in this condition. "'You are grieving for Geoffrey,' she said. "'He will come back to us.' "'Geoffrey is dead,' Marion wailed. "'He will never come back, and I—' She paused. She had not lost control of herself entirely, but the look in her eyes, the expression of her face, the significant pause, told Vera a story. It burst upon her with the full force of a sudden illumination. "'Marion,' she whispered, "'you love him as well as I do.' So her secret was known at last, and Marion was only a woman after all. The selfishness of her grief drove away all other emotions. "'As you do,' she cried. What do you with your gentle nature know of love? You want the wild hot blood in your veins to feel the real fire of a lasting, devouring affection. I tell you, I love him ten thousand times more than you do. Look at me. I am utterly lost and abased with my grief and humiliation. Am I not an object of pity? Geoffrey is dead, I tell you. I know it. I feel it. Love him as you do. And you stand there without so much as a single tear for his dear memory. Vera flushed. The word stung her keenly. How cold and callous Marion must think her. And yet Marion would have been equally cold and self-contained had she known and it was impossible to give her a single hint. "'My heart and soul are wrapped up in Geoffrey,' she said. "'If anything happens to him, I shall have nothing to live for. "'But I am not going to give way yet. "'There is still hope, and I shall hope to the end.' Marion sat up suddenly and dried her tears. "'You are a reproach to me.' she said with a watery smile. Not one word of reproof has passed your lips, and yet you are a reproof to me. And to think that you should have learned my secret! I could die of shame!" Vera kissed the other tenderly. 
Why? she asked. Surely there is no shame in a pure and disinterested affection. From your point of view, no, said Marion. But if you could place yourself in my position, you would not regard it in the same light. I have cared for Geoffrey ever since I came here. All along I have loved him. I knew that he was pledged to you, and knew that he could never be anything to me, and still I loved him. Who shall comprehend the waywardness of a woman's heart? And now he is dead. Once more the tears rose to Marion's eyes. She rocked herself to and fro, as if suffering from bitter anguish. "'I do not believe that Geoffrey is dead,' said Vera. "'Something tells me that he will be spared. "'But why go on like this? "'Anybody would imagine that you had something to do with it "'from the expression of your face.' "'Marion looked up suddenly. "'Something to do with it?' she echoed dully, mechanically. "'I wasn't speaking literally, of course,' Vera went on. "'But your curious expression—' "'What is curious about my expression?' "'It is so strange. It is not like grief so much as remorse.' Marion broke into a queer laugh, a laugh she strangled. As she passed her handkerchief across her face, she seemed to wipe out that strange expression. "'I hope remorse and I will remain strangers for many a long day,' she said more composedly. "'It is so difficult to judge from faces. And I must try to be brave like yourself. I have never given way before.' "'I believe you are the bravest of us all, Marion.' and I that I am the greatest coward. I have even been so weak as to allow the secret of my life to escape me. Vera, I want you to make me a most sacred promise. A dozen, if you like, dear. Then I want you to promise that Geoffrey shall never know of your discovery. At no time are you to tell him. Promise. Marion looked up eagerly and met Vera's eyes. They were clear and true and honest. They were filled with frankness and pity. "'I promise from my heart,' she said. "'Not now nor at any time shall Geoffrey know what I have learned today.' Marion blessed the speaker tenderly. "'I am satisfied,' she said. "'He will never know.' End of chapter 41。chapter 42 of the mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。chapter 42 。the search。Mrs. May sat out on the lawn before the rose garlanded windows of her sitting room. A Japanese umbrella was over her dainty head, a scented cigarette between her lips. For some time she had been long and earnestly sweeping the sea with a pair of binoculars. She rose at length and made her way down the garden. There was a rugged path at the bottom, terminating in a thicket that overhung the cliffs. Here it would be possible for a dozen men to hide without the slightest chance of being discovered. Nobody ever went there by any chance. Shaded from the house, Mrs. May paused. A softened whistle came from her lips, and then there came from the ground the dusky form of the man who called himself Ben Heer. He salaamed profoundly. "'Well?' the woman demanded impatiently. "'Well?' "'Well, indeed, my mistress.' the sham ben here replied calmly it fell out as you arranged behold a puff of wind carried away the masts and behold the oars came into fragments then the boat began to fill and now lies bottom upward at the foot of the cliff 
"'But he might have been a powerful swimmer.' "'He was no swimmer at all. I saw everything.' "'It was not possible for him to be picked up?' "'Not possible, my mistress. There was no boat, no sail to be seen. The boat foundered, and there was an end of it. I waited for some time, and I saw no more.' Mrs. May nodded carelessly. She might have been receiving the intelligence of the drowning of a refractory puppy. She betrayed neither regret nor satisfaction. "'Of course they will guess,' she said. "'When they come to examine the boat and the oars, they will see at once that there has been foul play. Once more they will know that the enemy has struck a blow.' "'My mistress is all-powerful,' Ben Heer murmured. "'They will try to trace us once more, Ben Heer.' The sham Asiatic shrugged his shoulders carelessly. "'And they will fail,' he said. "'They know not the powers arrayed against them. "'The dogs know not, my gracious mistress. "'Meanwhile thy slave can see through the bushes "'that somebody awaits your presence.' Mrs. May glanced in the direction indicated by Ben Heer. On the lawn, Rupert Ravenspur was standing. The woman smiled. There was the head of the hated house actually seeking out the foe. "'Your eyes are sharper than mine,' she said. "'Well, you have need of them. Meanwhile, you had better discreetly disappear for the time.' Mrs. May advanced to greet her guest. He bowed with his old-fashioned grace. "'This is an unexpected honor," the woman said. "'I can claim nothing of the score of politeness or gallantry,' Rupert Ravenspur replied. He was quiet and polished as usual, but there was a look of deep distress on his face. I came here not to see you, but in the faint hope of finding my nephew, Geoffrey. I have ascertained that he came to see you sometimes. He has been so good, Mrs. May murmured. I assure you I appreciate the company of a gentleman in this deserted spot. Then he has not been here today? I have not had the pleasure of seeing Mr. Geoffrey today. Ravenspur groaned. He turned his face away, ashamed that a woman should see him in a moment of weakness. Out of the corner of her eye she regarded him. There was not a drop of pity in her heart for him. "'I hope you don't anticipate anything wrong,' she said. "'Mr. Geoffrey is not a boy that he cannot—' "'Oh, you do not understand.' It is not that at all. In ordinary circumstances I could trust Geoffrey to the end of the world. He is a good fellow, and capable of taking care of himself and upholding the family honor. But others as strong and more cunning have fallen before the dreaded foe, until all confidence has left us. I fear much that harm has come to Geoffrey. But surely in the broad daylight— "'Daylight or darkness, it is the same. "'You know nothing of the boy?' "'Nothing, save that he was going fishing today.' Ravenspur started. "'Oh!' he cried. "'Then I shall soon know the worst. "'I am sorry to have troubled you. "'I will go down to the beach. "'The others are searching in all directions.' Nobody will return to the house until we know the lad's fate. Ravenspur bowed and was gone. Mrs. May smiled after him. So the castle was going to be left for the time being. "'This is a chance not to be lost,' she murmured. "'The full run of the castle. Fate is playing into my hands with a vengeance.' Full of the wildest apprehension, Ravenspur made his way to the beach. It was no easy task for a man of his years, 
but he made light of it as he used to half a century ago. Two fishermen coming up touched their hats. "'Have you been out to the west of Gull Point today?' Ravenspur asked. "'No, sir,' was the reply. "'Not one of us. The mackerel came in from the east, and there were so many we had every bottom afloat.' I did hear as Mr. Geoffrey had gone out in the West Bay, but I can't say for sure. Again Ravenspur groaned. No longer had he the least doubt about what had happened. There had been more foul play, and Geoffrey had gone down under the dark waters. The old man's heart was full to bursting, but his grief was for Vera more than for himself. I am afraid there has been another one of those tragedies that are so mournfully identified with our name, he said. Wass and Watkins, will you come with me? The fishermen dropped the brown tangled nets upon their shoulders and followed. They were all tenants, vassals almost, of the raven spurs and ready to do their bidding. The foe would have had a hard time did he fall into the clutches of these veterans. "'I am going down to search the beach,' Ravenspur explained. "'I know that my nephew went out fishing this afternoon. I shall know his fate soon.' It was some time before anything was found. Wass came stumbling over the rocks, and there, in a clear pool, he saw the boat bottom upward. At the cry of dismay that came from him, Watkins hurried up. "'Give a hand with the painter, Bill,' Wass said hoarsely. "'There's the boat right enough with a good round hole under the gunwale.' Ravenspur watched in silence. He saw the boat beached. He saw the hole in her side. Wass pointed to the mast where it had been sawn off. "'Poor young gentleman!' he exclaimed with a hearty outburst of grief. "'And to think that we shall never see him again. Look at this, sir.' "'The mast seems to have been sawn off,' said Ravenspur. "'Almost off, sir,' said Watkins. "'Enough to give if a puff of wind came. And that hole has been plugged with soft glue or something of the kind.' "'If I could only lay a hand on him!' He shook his fist in the air in impotent rage. Tears filled his eyes. Ravenspur stood motionless. He was trying to bring the force of the tragedy home to himself, trying to shape words to tell Vera without cutting her to the heart. He was long past the more violent emotions. He turned to Wass like a man in a dream. "'Go up to the castle,' he said. "'See my son Gordon and bid him come here. "'They must all come down, all aid in the search. "'Not a word more. Please go.'" End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of The Mystery of the Raven Spurs by Fred M. White this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 Nearer To Geoffrey the position was a strange one. There was something unreal about the whole thing. Nor was it pleasant to remember that by this time the family had missed him, and were doubtless bewailing him for dead. "'I am afraid there is no help for it,' said Tchigorsky. I could not see my way to certain conclusions and ends without inconvenience. "'Something more than inconvenience,' Geoffrey murmured. "'Anxiety, troubles, what you like,' Tchigorsky replied coolly. "'It is necessary. I want to have the castle cleared for a time, and I can think of no better and less suspicious way of doing it. The anxiety and suspense will not last long, and by daylight your people shall see you again. And the one who is most likely to suffer has been already relieved. 
So Geoffrey was fain to wait in the cave, listening to Tchigorsky's piquant conversation, and waiting for the time to come for action. "'There will be plenty to do presently,' the Russian said. "'Meanwhile I am going to leave you to yourself for a space. The woman who regards me as her servant may need me. And remember, you are not to leave the cave in any circumstances, else all my delicately laid plans will be blown to the winds.' So saying, Tchigorsky disappeared. It seemed hours before anything happened. It was safe in the cave, nobody was likely to come there, and if they did, there was not the slightest chance of discovery, for the cave went far under the cliff and was dark as the throat of a wolf. By and by there came the sound of voices on the beach, and Rupert Ravenspur, followed by the two fishermen, appeared. Geoffrey's heart smote him as he saw his grandfather. Then they found the boat, and directly afterwards the two fishermen rushed away, leaving Ravenspur behind. It was only the strongest self-control that prevented Geoffrey from making his presence known to the figure gazing so sadly at the boat. But he remembered Tchigorsky's warning. After all, he reflected, it would only be for a little time, and the head of the family knew nothing of the great conspiracies working themselves out around him. His open, honorable nature would have shrunk from the subtle diplomacy and cunning that appeared so powerfully to Tchigorsky. Rupert Ravenspur would not have tolerated the position for a moment. He would have insisted upon going to Mrs. May and having the matter out at once, or he would have called in the police. And that course would be fatal. So Geoffrey was constrained to stay and watch. Presently he saw the fishermen return, followed by the family. There was a gathering about the foundered boat, and then Geoffrey turned his eyes away, ashamed to witness the emotion caused by what they regarded as his untimely death. He had seen them all and beheld their grief. He could see Marion bent down with a handkerchief to her streaming eyes, and the head of the family comforting her. He saw Vera apart from the rest, gazing out to sea. Beyond, a fleet of boats were coming round the point. They were small fishing smacks in search of the drowned Ravenspur. Geoffrey pinched himself to make sure he was awake. It is not often that a live man sits watching people search for his dead body. But there was comfort in the knowledge that Vera was aware of everything. Geoffrey could see that she had been told. That was why she kept apart from the rest. She walked along the sands past the mouth of the cave, her head bent down. Flesh and blood could stand it no longer. In the mouth of the cave Geoffrey stood and called Vera softly by name. The girl started and half turned. "'Don't be alarmed,' Geoffrey whispered. "'I am in the cave. It is safe here. Watch your opportunity and come in, for I must have a few words with you. Only do it naturally and don't let anybody suspect.' Vera had turned her back to the cave and appeared to be sadly gazing over the sea. Gradually she slipped back, watching the others, who apparently had forgotten her, until she was lost in the gloom of the cavern. A moment later and Geoffrey had her in his arms. It was good to feel her heart beating against his, to feel her kisses warm on his lips. "'Did Tchigorsky tell you?' he asked. "'No. Uncle Ralph.' Oh, I am so glad to see you again, Geoffrey. I knew you were not lost, that you would be safe after what Uncle said, and yet all the time there was a strange void in my heart. But, my darling, I am safe. Vera laid her head restfully on his shoulder. 
"'I know, I know,' she said. "'But I have had a foretaste of what might have been. "'When Wass and Watkins came and told me that your overturned boat had been found, "'I began to realize what it might be to live without you. "'Dear Jeff, will it be long before all this anxiety is disposed of?' Geoffrey kissed her trembling lips. "'Not long, so Chigorsky says, and I have implicit faith in him. The present situation is all part of the plot of our salvation. And the others? Are heartbroken. My poor grandfather looks ten years older. You know how entirely he has been wrapped up in us.' I feel sure that if he could have saved us by sacrificing the rest, himself included, he would have done so. "'I know,' Geoffrey said hoarsely. "'I know, dear. And Marion?' "'Marion is sorely disturbed. I hardly know what to make of Marion. For the first time she positively appears to be frightened.' and Marion is not the girl who cries. I was alarmed about her a little time ago, replied Vera. Ah, well, it won't be very long, Geoffrey said consolingly. Tomorrow morning Tchigorsky has promised me that I shall be safe and sound in the bosom of the family again. What are they going to do now? They are going to search until they find you. All the boats from the village are out, even the servants are assisting. You can understand how I should feel if I did not know everything. I could not stay in the house. I could do no more than wander along the shore feeling that I was helping. It would be impossible to remain in the house, and that is what they all feel. There is a full moon tonight, and they will be here till they are exhausted. Geoffrey nodded. He was wondering how he was going to account for his absence and for the manner in which he was finally to turn up safe and sound again. He would have to concoct some story of being picked up by a passing boat and landed some way down the coast. "'They guess I am a victim to the vendetta?' he asked. "'Of course. They say the mast and oars were partly sawn away.' It will be the talk of the country in a few hours. Geoffrey, I must go. Don't you see that they have missed me? Vera had been missed. Already Marion was calling her. There was just the chance that she might be yet another victim. Vera slipped out of the cave, walking backwards, as if she were looking for something. You won't betray yourself? said Geoffrey. I'll try not to, dear. I understand how necessary it is that the truth should be concealed, and yet it is hard not to be able to ease their minds. Vera was clear of the cave by this time, and her voice ceased. A few yards farther on, and Marion came up to her. She was looking pale and ghastly. There were rings under her eyes. Her nerves had had a terrible shock. "'I couldn't imagine where you had got to,' she said. "'I looked round and you had disappeared. I feared you had been spirited away.' "'By the cruel foe, Marion? One by one we go. It may be your turn next.' "'Would to heaven that it was,' Marion whispered vehemently. A little time ago I fancied that I was strong enough to bear up against anything. Now I know what a feeble creature I am. Before this happened I would have a thousand times been the victim myself. And I, I... She paused and beat the air impotently. Vera wondered. Could this really be the strong, self-reliant Marion who had uplifted them in so many troubles? This the girl who always had a smile on her face and words of comfort on her lips? This was a weak, frightened creature, with eyes that were haunted. "'Be brave,' 
said Vera, and be yourself. What should we do without you? Why, you are so full of remorse you might have been responsible for Geoffrey's death yourself. Marion looked up swiftly, and then her eyes fell. "'It is because I love him,' she said. "'And I love him, too. But I try to be brave.' Marion was silent under the reproof. Vera was calm and collected. What a reaction there would be later, Marion thought. "'You have not given up all hope?' she asked. "'No, I cannot. It would be too cruel. I cannot imagine that anything really serious has happened to Geoffrey. I cannot feel anything for the present save for you. And my heart is full for you, Marion.' "'Aye,' Marion said drearily. "'It need be.' Vera turned and walked swiftly across the sands. She wanted to be alone now that no danger threatened. Then presently the moon rose and shone upon the people gathered on the fringe of the sea. To the impatient Geoffrey came Ralph Ravenspur, with the cloak and slouched hat over his arm. End of chapter 43《Chapter Forty Four of the Mystery of the Ravenspurs by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty Four Still Nearer. He entered as coolly and easily as if he had been doing this kind of thing all his life, as if he had the full use of his eyesight. I can't see you, but of course you are there, he said. Tchigorsky sent me because he cannot come himself. The jade he calls his mistress has need of him. Muffle yourself and follow me. Not too closely. Geoffrey was only too glad of the opportunity. He passed under the shadow of the rocks until he gained the path to the head of the cliffs, and here Ralph paused. "'We are safe now,' he said. You can remove your disguise and cross the terrace. There is not a living soul in the castle at present. All the servants are on the beach, then? Every one of them, both male and female, which is a flattering testimony to your popularity, Geoffrey. I opine that they will be pleased to see you in the morning. By the way, have you concocted a plausible story to account for your escape? I haven't, Geoffrey admitted with a smile. I preferred to leave it to the greater talents of Tchigorsky and yourself. I have no genius for fiction. Ralph muttered that the matter might be safely left in their hands, and then they entered the deserted castle and made their way to Ralph's room. Here the two doors were closed, and Ralph sat down silently over his pipe. "'Is anything going to happen?' Geoffrey asked. "'A great deal during the next hour or two, Ralph replied. "'But it is impossible to forecast, and you will see it all for yourself in good time. I can't do anything until I have heard further from our friend Tchigorsky.' Half an hour passed in dead silence, and then there was a rapping on the window. When the casement was thrown open, the head of Tchigorsky appeared. He was clad in oriental robes and had made his way upwards by climbing the thick ivy that grew on that side of the house. He nodded to Geoffrey. "'I told you we should meet again,' he said. "'I have just ten minutes to spare.' A cigarette, please. Geoffrey handed over the cigarette. Have you discovered it all? Ralph asked. I have discovered nothing, Tchigorsky said calmly from behind the cloud of smoke. At present I have not the remotest idea which way she will strike. 
"'Ah, she is in one of her suspicious moods, when she trusts nobody.' "'Quite right. All I can tell you is that she is coming here presently. She is well aware that there is not a soul in the house. She knows that this state of things is likely to last for some time. She will come by and by, and with her she will bring some great danger to the house of Ravenspur.' What form that danger is to take, I cannot say, but I shall find out. The last words came from Tchigorsky's lips with a snap. But she will want confederates, said Geoffrey. She may or she may not. She is a woman of infinite resource. Nobody knows what mischief she is capable of. If she brings me along, I may be exceedingly useful. If she leaves me behind, I shall be more usefully employed in going over her papers and documents. You see, I know the language. But be that as it may, this is going to be an eventful night. Tchigorsky finished his cigarette and rose to go. He had few instructions to leave behind him, and these few were of an exceedingly simple nature. All that Geoffrey and Ralph Ravenspur had to do was to watch. They were to keep their eyes open and be largely guided by events. And there were to be no lights. Half an hour passed before Ralph rose and softly opened the door. For a little time he threw the casement open wide. As Geoffrey drew a match from his box, Ralph laid a restraining hand on his arm. "'No more smoking,' he said. "'I purposely opened the casement to sweeten the air of the room. "'My dear boy, you do not want to betray us with the smell of fresh tobacco. "'The enemy would take alarm at once.' "'I had forgotten,' Geoffrey murmured. "'How stupid of me!' "'Again silence and painful tension on the nerves.' Presently below came the soft fall of a foot, and then a noise as if a human body had come in contact with some object in the dark. There was the scratch of a match and a ball of flame flickered in ghastly fashion in the hall. "'The foe is here,' Ralph whispered. "'Go and look over. Your rubber-soled boots are in the corner. Put them on.' Geoffrey did as he desired. He crept along the corridor until he could look down into the hall. There he saw a woman, a woman who wore short skirts and a closely fitting jacket. She had a small lantern in her hand, the light of which she seemed to lower or heighten by pressing a stud. Behind her came the two Orientals, who carried a small but heavy brass-bound box between them. This, at a sign from the woman, they deposited on the floor. As far as Geoffrey could judge, neither of these two men was Tchigorsky. He could catch the sound of whispered conversation, but the words conveyed no meaning to his ears. The two discoursed in a language he did not understand. A hand was laid on Geoffrey's arm. He turned to see Ralph by his side. The latter bent over the balustrade, listening with all his ears. Down below, the brass box was being opened, and the contents were placed upon the floor. The contents looked like machinery, but it was machinery of a kind that Geoffrey had never seen before. There was a small disk of hammered copper, and to this was attached a number of what seemed to be Indian rubber snakes. At a sign from the woman, the two Asiatics picked up the box and its contents and started away toward the kitchen. Noiseless as they were, Ralph heard them. He clutched his companion's arm. "'They have gone,' he whispered. "'In which direction?' "'They had moved off towards the kitchen,' said Geoffrey. "'Good. This thing is turning out exactly as I expected. "'They had something with them?' 
Yes, a thing like a copper octopus with India rubber tentacles. They have taken it with them. A most extraordinary affair. It will be more extraordinary still before it is finished, said Ralph grimly. Follow them and report what you see. Take good care not to be seen. Unless I am mistaken, they are going down to the vaults and are planning a coup to do for us all tonight. Geoffrey crept silently down the stairs. Then he made his way swiftly along the passages until he came to the cellars. Then the steady blowing of a current of fresh air told him that Ralph's suggestion was right. Down he went until he came to the channel leading to the vaults. But he was cautious. He peeped down. Below him were three figures, and once more they had spread out their queer apparatus. By the side of it were two large glass-stopped bottles, such as one sees in a laboratory, receptacles for acids and the like. They were tightly tied over the stoppers. The woman picked up one of them and removed the parchment. Before she drew the stopper, she donned thick glasses and a mask for her face, the two Orientals doing the same. They were evidently dealing with some very dangerous poison. The stopper was removed, and a few spots of the acid dropped on the copper disc. A white smoke arose, which, small as it was, filled the air with a pungent odor. Almost immediately the acid was wiped off and the odor ceased. Only just a whiff of it reached Geoffrey's nose, but it turned him faint, giddy for an instant. What was going to happen next? End of chapter 44《ハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハッピーバーベキューハ but their words conveyed nothing to him. On the floor of the vault, the queer-looking machinery was spread out, and to the ends of the india-rubber tubes wires were attached. No sooner had this been accomplished than the woman, after giving some rapid instructions to her allies, left the vault. She was so quick that Geoffrey barely had time to conceal himself behind a pillar before she passed him. The woman was masked and disguised beyond recognition, but Geoffrey had no need to be told who she was. He knew that he was in the presence of Mrs. May, and, despite his knowledge of her cleverness and resource, he found himself marveling to see her display so fine a knowledge of the house. The woman passed along, dragging a number of fine light wires after her. The other ends of the wires were attached to the queer-looking apparatus in the vault. Mrs. May went along the passages, along the corridor, and up the stairs, as if she had been accustomed to the house all her life. Surely she must have been here many times before, or she would not have exhibited such fearless confidence. The idea of the black gliding figure creeping about the house in the dead of night filled Geoffrey with loathing. All the same, he did not neglect his opportunities. He followed swiftly and silently until he came to the main corridor on the first landing. Here, to his surprise, the woman turned into one of the bedrooms, the room used by the head of the house. She closed the door behind her. What to do next? But Geoffrey was not long in doubt. Ralph was standing by his side, a dark lantern in his hand. "'Where did she go?' 
he whispered. "'You heard her, then?' asked Geoffrey. "'Of course. I heard everything. I see with my ears. Naturally you guessed who she was, but what room did she go into?' "'My grandfather's.' "'So I expected. But she means to visit all the rooms in turn. You need not be afraid. She will be there for some minutes. What do you see outside?' Geoffrey made a close examination with the lantern. "'I see a tangle of small wires on the floor,' he said. "'They come up from the vaults. "'Where they are attached to a queer-looking instrument?' "'Yes, yes. I see you know all about it. One of the wires runs under the door into the room where Mrs. May is engaged. "'And where she will be engaged for some time,' said Ralph. "'Move that book ladder and look over the fanlight.' There were books on high shelves in the corridor, and a light librarian's ladder close at hand. Geoffrey propped this against the door and looked in through the open fanlight. All the bedroom doors had fanlights at Ravenspur. The lantern inside was on the dressing table, and standing on a chair by a fireplace was Mrs. May. She had pinned the thin wire to the wall cunningly, and had turned the end of it into a plate that stood on the mantel shelf. From a flask she poured a little white powder into the plate. This done, she seemed to be satisfied. Geoffrey whipped the ladder away, and the woman emerged from the room. Once more she went along the corridor with firm, resolute step, and the air of one who knows what she is doing and has a definite object in view. From one bedroom to another she went, leaving a wire in each, until every room occupied by one of the Ravenspur family had been visited. Geoffrey's room was the last. When she had finished here, she took up a pair of scissors and tapped the wire. Outside the door, Geoffrey and Ralph could hear the noise distinctly. Ralph's jaws came together with a click. "'The key is outside your room door,' he whispered turn it geoffrey wondered but he hastened to comply the key turned with an ease and silence that testified to the fact of its having been carefully oiled what does it all mean geoffrey whispered she is going to test her machinery said ralph with a chuckle and she is going one step farther to her own destruction listen Again came the faint tap, and then down from far below the purring jar of electrical apparatus in motion. There was silence inside the room for a moment, and then Geoffrey saw the handle turn. It was turned softly at first, then more quickly, and finally it was tugged as an angry child snatches at a toy. Ralph chuckled. The diabolical mirth seemed to come deep from his throat. "'She is trying to get out,' Geoffrey whispered. "'Of course she is,' Ralph replied. "'But not quite yet.' The lock was rattling loudly by this time. There was a half-angry, half-frightened muttering from within, and then there came a long, piercing, wailing scream as of a woman in the last agony before death. Geoffrey would have started back, but Ralph restrained him. "'No, no,' he whispered violently. "'It's all right. Everything is turning out splendidly.' "'But she is a woman and in deadly peril, uncle.' "'I know it, lad. Five minutes more, and that fiend will be beyond further mischief.' She has been trying the effect of her infernal contrivance, and will be hoist with her own petard. She is scared to death. She imagines she has fastened herself in and can't get out. "'But this is murder!' 
Geoffrey cried. "'I dare say some people would call it so,' Ralph replied coolly. "'As a matter of fact, there never could be homicide more justifiable than to let that woman perish there. Still, we are not going to do anything of the kind. When those cries cease and you hear yonder wretch fall to the ground, then open the door and drag her out. The cries were coming wildly from behind the door. There was a hammering on the panels. The cries rang through the house. They reached the Asiatics in the vaults, and the latter fled in terror into the night. Something had happened, but what it was they did not care. They had only themselves to think of. In spite of his strong nerves, Geoffrey shuddered. It was horrible to be alone in that grim house of tears, waiting in the darkness, opposed by grim horrors and, above all, to have that note of agony ringing in his ears. Would it never stop? Would the time to act never come? Geoffrey would have interfered in spite of everything, but for the fact that Ralph was gripping his shoulder in a grasp that at any other time would have been painful. Suddenly the noise ceased. There was a moan and the soft crushing fall of a body. Ralph's face blazed up instantly. "'Now!' he cried. "'There is no time to be lost.' Geoffrey darted forward. He had the door opened in an instant. Mrs. May lay still and white on the floor. The atmosphere of the room seemed to have vanished. It was intolerable to breathe there. Air there was none. As the door fell back, the room filled as with a sudden strong draft. Geoffrey dragged the unconscious figure into the corridor. "'Will she die?' he gasped. "'No, she will not die,' Ralph said coolly. "'Had I intended her to die, I should not have allowed you to open the door. Pick her up and throw her on one of the beds in a spare room. She will require no attention, but she will not attain consciousness for some hours, and after that she will be useless for a day or two. You need not worry. Our scheme is working out splendidly. Pick her up. Ralph indicated the still figure with brutal indifference. He would have shown more consideration to a sick dog. Geoffrey complied, and presently made the woman as comfortable as circumstances allowed. Geoffrey had hardly done so before there was a light footfall in the corridor, and Tchigorsky appeared still in disguise. "'I gather that things are well,' he said. "'Just now I met that she-devil's accomplices fleeing as if the father of lies was behind them. She was trapped, eh?' Ralph nodded and chuckled. "'In Geoffrey's room,' he explained. "'When she was testing her apparatus, I had the key turned on her, and she could not get out.' I let her remain there as long as I considered it safe to do so, and her yells must have alarmed her confederates. Probably they have fled, leaving things intact. Probably, said Tchigorsky. I will go and see. He was back again presently, a pleased expression on his face. Nothing has been touched, he said. I have removed the wires in case of danger. We have the lady more or less under our thumb. What was she doing? Geoffrey asked. It is an appliance for exhausting air, Tchigorsky explained. You take a powder and place it on a hot plate. Directly it begins to burn, it draws up all the air. The thing has been known in the East for thousands of years. Mrs. May applied electricity to give her greater scope. A plate of the powder was to be heated in the room of everybody in the castle when asleep. A few minutes and the thing is done. 
then the wires are withdrawn and gradually the different rooms are filled with air again the burnt powder leaves no trace then you are all found dead in your beds and nobody knows how it is done the wires are easily drawn back to the battery and the whole thing is destroyed geoffrey shuddered what a fiend End of chapter 45